Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan um, and to this morning's deep dive event. These deep dive events, we ask panels of experts to look at um, issues of current interest. And of course, I think the subject we're going to be talking about today, which is problems in the banking system, uh, is very, very topical indeed. So um, I'm Anthony Rowley, I'm a former president of the club and I will be acting as moderator today. So let me, let me go ahead and introduce our, our panelists right away. Um, to, uh, in the, I'm introduce them in the order that they will be speaking. To my immediate right is uh, Toru Sasaki, who is managing director and head of Japan Markets Research at JP Morgan Chase Bank and uh, J.P. Uh, Morgan Securities Japan Company. Um, following Sasaki-san uh, will be Sayuri Shirai, Professor Dr. Shirai, who's on my right, looking very spring-like. <laughs> um, she is a professor at the Faculty of Policy Management at Keio University and a former member of the um, Bank of Japan Policy Board. And to my left is a well-known face, uh, Jesper Cole, who is, um, well, what should I say? He, he's um, a leading uh, Japan strategist and economist and a regular speaker at this club. So um, so those are the speakers. Okay, well, we're going to be focusing um, chiefly on the changes at the top of the Bank of Japan, which are about to take place. Uh, as um, Haruhiko Kuroda steps down next month as governor uh, of the BOJ and... Oedesan Katsuo takes his place. Um, and also there will be changes in the deputy governors. So we're going to be looking at what these changes mean for monetary policy in Japan um, and for the environment in which Japanese financial institutions operate. Um, well, obviously, events have moved fast since this deep dive was first announced a week or so ago with the collapse of um, Silicon Valley Bank and uh, also a signature bank and the trauma impacting Credit Suisse and other banks. Um, and this obviously has given rise to considerable concern in financial markets and the, the dreaded term systemic financial crisis is beginning to be bandied around again. Uh, obviously, uh, one thing we will hope to hear something from our speakers is something about how how great or not is the danger of contagion spreading to Japanese banks and financial institutions. Um, so with that, um, I will um, ask uh, Sasaki-san to, to lead off. But first, I'll just say a little more about his background. Um, he is, as I say, managing director and head of Japan Markets Research with JP Morgan Chase Bank, Tokyo, and JP Morgan Securities Japan. Before he joined JP Morgan in uh, 2003, Sasaki-san Sasaki held several positions with the Bank of Japan where, he, worked, where he, he had worked since 1992. He served as uh, Bank of Japan representative of, of the Americas um, between 2000 and 2003, where he was responsible for exchanging market information and views with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and other US financial authorities. Sasaki-san also worked as a senior trader in the foreign exchange uh, division of the Bank of Japan, Tokyo office, uh, from 1994 to 1997, where his responsibilities included the execution of foreign exchange intervention and the provision of foreign exchange market analysis to senior policymakers. He began his career in the research and statistics division of the Bank of Japan in 1992 after receiving his Bachelor of Arts degree from Sophia University He's a chartered member of the Securities Analysts Association of Japan and a chartered member of the Securities Analysts Association... Oh, Association of Japan. Sorry, that's a repeat. So, Sasaki-san, if you would begin. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Anthony-san. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Toru Sasaki. I'm uh, head of J Japan Macro uh, Research in J.P. Morgan. Uh, I'm a bit nervous about, uh, about speaking uh, before uh, such a prestigious speakers like uh, Shirai-san and uh, Yespa-san. 
Uh, but I think I, Anthony San's expectation on me is to speak about uh, some kind of a perspective from the market. So uh, I, I try to, uh, to uh, I mean, I'm trying to, uh, to give some kind of uh, uh, the information uh, what the market is thinking or what we, JP Morgan is thinking uh, from the market perspective. The first of all, maybe I'd like to uh, maybe make a comment about the recent uh, developments in the US and the European banking system. Uh, I think these issues are very much like uh, uh, liquidity and the risk management issue of the particular financial institutions. And then it's, it, we shouldn't necessarily uh, connect to, uh, to the uh, systemic risks uh, uh, so quickly. And then also, uh, yeah, of course, no, we, we ha always have to wo uh, worry about being careful about the, uh, that kind of a uh, uh, big expansion of the problem. But uh, looking at uh, these uh, uh, developments in the past several days, uh, especially uh, since the uh, weekend, uh, the uh, authorities, monetary authorities in the other major countries seems to be, uh, to be I mean, uh, authorities have been learning a lot uh, to how to tackle obviously this kind of problem. So, uh, so I think uh, uh, it will be uh, contained uh, to the uh, just uh, uh, for the particular financial institutions. And then, you know, in last last I mean last night, the market sentiment has improved uh, significantly. So, uh, you know, of course, uh, I, I don't want to be too optimistic about this problem, but. Uh, I don't also don't want to be uh, too pessimistic about these uh, the events uh, in the past several days. So uh, now I'd like to uh, comment on the uh, Japanese situation. Uh, obviously, the Japan has been learning a lot uh, about the uh, monetary policy and the market situation. And then Japan, uh, I know maybe the question answering son as answering son asked the you know, question is whether uh, these problems in Europe and uh, uh, US uh, will have an uh, impact on Japan. Uh, so my answer is probably no. Uh, you know, the Japan doesn't have a si same kind of problem uh, with this US and the uh, European bank. Uh, but uh, Japan has uh, probably different uh, problems. So now the Japanese authorities, uh, BOJ, uh, is probably needs to tackle or handle with this uh, problem under the new governor and deputy governors. So uh, please uh, go to the uh, uh, first slide. Sorry, it's too small. Uh, I don't, but uh, I, I just want to uh, uh, to uh, explain how, what, what I'm trying to say. Again, I, I'm a bit nervous about talking about the BOJ uh, in front of the Shirei-san, uh, but uh, uh, just let me focus on this screen. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, basically, uh, we checked uh, what uh, Weather Sun has been talking uh, in the uh, uh, monetary, policy board, uh, monetary policy meeting when he was in a board member. One thing we want to highlight uh, is that he has been um, taking care of the market reactions. For example, in 1999, uh, the BOJ introduced the uh, zero interest rate policy. And also the, uh, in 2000, uh, they tried to exit from the zero, uh, actually they exit from the zero interest rate policy. In both cases, uh, the weather sun uh, is showing the, uh, how can I say, the concern over the reaction from the market. So they, he always think, thinking that you know we have to uh, be careful about the presentation to the market, and also the, uh, the he also worrying about the stock market reaction. So my my take away take take, take away from this uh, minutes of the uh, uh, BOJ's monetary policy in 1999 and 2000 is that probably uh, the new BOJ uh, will uh, try to have a good communication with the market. Uh, in the past, uh, you know, sometimes the BOJ has been surprised the market and it caused the volatility. But uh, going forward, under the new uh, governor and the deputies, I think uh, uh, the, the communication uh, will uh, improve uh, with the uh, new uh, BOJ. 
And one thing uh, I, I like to highlight is that the 2001, when the BOJ introduced the quantitative easing, uh, quantitative easing uh, BOJ uh, decided to increase the uh, current deposit from 4 trillion yen to 5 trillion yen in 2001. In that meeting, uh, with the Sun uh, actually supported the quantitative easing, but he also shows that the concern about the, uh, uh, how can I say, negative effect uh, from the quantitative easing. He said that the, uh, if we increase the current deposit from 4 trillion yen to 5 trillion yen, which is very easy to change the target, the market will expect that the 6 trillion yen, 7 trillion yen, and if there is no effect, that's going to be hell. Actually, that, that's what he said. So uh, actually, he he was right. Uh, you know, the BOJ just keep increased, uh, keep increasing the uh, the uh, current deposit. So uh, the, so our takeaway from is that from this comment, uh, this kind of comment is that probably uh, with the sun is not believing uh, the uh, impact uh, from the quantity. Uh, so. Uh, and maybe more focus on the interest rate. So as a result, what we are expecting on the new BOJ uh, is that we expect that the, uh, the BOJ to hold the emergency meeting between April and June, and then widen the YCC band to plus minus 100 base point. That's our uh, official focus. Why emergency, emergency uh, meeting is that uh, because uh, the first meeting under the new governor is uh, April 27th and 28th. That is just before Golden Week. So uh, maybe it's not good timing to move. But uh, the following meeting is June 15th and June 16th. That is one and a half months away. So it's too, too, too far away. So that's why our, our economists expect that the BOJ to hold the uh, emergency meeting between April and then June meeting. But uh, Japan has a Hiroshima summit May on May 19th and uh, 20th, between May, May 19th and 21st. So maybe the BOJ don't, does not want to move before that. So our expectation is maybe BOJ will hold the emergency meeting uh, somewhere uh, in the, uh, the latter half of May or early June. That's our expectation. So please go to the next page. Uh, and so what, what is the impact on the uh, JGB market? I just tried to, uh, I just wrote the uh, first two uh, lines, but uh, maybe I'll just explain in my uh, word. Uh, basically what we expect is that the BOJ will maintain the negative interest rate uh, at the zero, I mean negative, negative in, uh, BOJ will maintain the negative interest rate policy as long as the BOJ's monetary policy, I mean, policy rate uh, remains negative, JGB 10-year yield is unlikely to spike uh, much beyond 1% point because the uh, negative interest rate policy, policy, policy rate in negative uh, will work as an anchor. So 10-year yield is unlikely to spike above 1%. So we expect that the JGB 10-year yield is likely to stay around 1% point. Even the BOJ, uh, you know, changed the YCC uh, target. Of course, you know, our, our, our focus is that to widen the YCC band to 100 basis point, but uh, I, actually it's going to be de facto uh, exit from the YCC because anyway, the ceiling of 10-year 10 10 yield is likely to 1%. But if the BOJ uh, exit from the negative interest rate policy and then go back to zero interest rate uh, on the policy rate, probably 10-year yield is likely to go uh, to 1.2%. That's the maximum. Uh, that's what we are saying, thinking. So the, anyway, even though the BOJ uh, exit from the YCC, uh, we don't expect much higher uh, longer term yield. And then now the many market participants and Japanese institutions are ready uh, for seeing such kind of exit from the YCC by the BOJ. So uh, 
we don't really worry about uh, the, um, the JGB market. And also, as I showed uh, uh, on the charts, but uh, sorry, again, it's too small, but basically what I tried to say, that since the BOJ introduced the zero interest rate policy, JGB 10 year yield uh, uh, was in 1.5% to 2% uh, range during the February 1999 to March 2001 until QE was introduced. So my point is that the, between zero interest rate policy was introduced and the QE was introduced. So before QE was introduced, the range of the 10 year yield was somewhere between 1.5 to 2%. So our expectation is 1.2%. So maybe something like the same, same level, um, maybe it, it will go over to 1.2 and reach to 1.5%, but that we don't expect that too much, too, too much higher uh, long-term yield. And then please go to the next page. Uh, this is showing the, the uh, light blue line is showing uh, JGB 10 year yield and dark blue line is showing the core CPI in Japan. Uh, I thought I thought it is interesting uh, before the governor Kuroda uh, start, started QQE, the JGB 10 year yield has been always above core CPI. But since the, uh, the governor Kuroda started QQE uh, in 2003, I mean, 2003, uh, 13, 13, 13, yeah, 13. Uh, the JGB 10-year yield start going lower the core CPI. So uh, now the core CPI is a uh, 3%. Uh, so that means that the, if the uh, BOJ uh, stop doing the QQE, uh, the you know, JGB 10 year yield is going above the uh, 3%. <laughs> Maybe that's a drastic, too drastic uh, expectation, but uh, I think this is an interesting uh, phenomenon. The just, just the past 10 year, JGB 10 year yield was below core CPI, but before that it was above. Okay, I'd like to stop here. And, and, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, let's pass on to our second speaker, who is Dr. Shirai. Uh, as I said, uh, she's a professor at the Faculty of Policy Management at Keio University and a former member of the Bank of Japan Policy Board. Professor Shirai is an advisor for sustainable policies at the Asian Development Bank Institute, the ADBI, and also an advisor to Nomura Research Center for Sustainability and Nishin Olio Group. Previously, she was senior advisor to EOS at uh, Federated Hermes, located in London, um, which provides ESG stewardship services to listed companies. She was a member of the policy board for Bank of Japan in 2011 until 2016, which, and of course, the policy board is responsible for making monetary policy decisions, as you know. She also taught uh, at, um, at Sciences Po, or PO, in Paris, and was an economist at the IMF. She holds a PhD in economics from Columbia University, and she's the author of numerous books and papers on a variety of subjects. And her latest book, uh, entitled Global Climate Challenges and Finance, will be published in June of this year from the Asian Development Bank Institute. So, Professor Shirai, please. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk, uh, to speak about uh, Bank of Japan's policy. Now, uh, can you go to my uh, PowerPoint presentation file? So uh, first, I'd like to talk about the uh, impact of this U.S. Uh, banking uh, issue, local, uh, local banking issue, and uh, Credit Suisse uh, program, how that uh, banking program uh, impact on the uh, Japanese uh, banking system. Next page, please. So uh, before I talk about BOJ's policy, uh, this is my tentative um, uh, evaluation. So the impact on the Japan's banking sector appears to be very limited uh, because number one, uh, the Japanese bank has tons of deposit and uh, about 70% come from individual deposit, which tends to be sticky and 30% of deposit come from corporate sectors and the corporate the depositors are highly diversified. And the number, uh, the point three, uh, the Japanese banks have a, a foreign bond 
But in terms of uh, out of total asset, it's very tiny. And number four, the Japanese banks uh, have a, a lot of JGB, uh, partly because they can use it as a collateral uh, from, 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 from borrowings. But I, I think BOJ will maintain the YCC, contrary to what Sasaki-san said. And so uh, there will be uh, no, imp no major impact in terms of interest rate risk with regards to this JGB holdings. And uh, in general, Japanese banks are well capitalized. So I think impact will be very limited. Now, in the case of the United States, I think these uh, regional banks, uh, maybe uh, this problem is contagious because uh, uh, even though um, the Silicon Valley banks is very unique because they have so much Japanese, uh, US government bond uh, compared to the capital. So uh, this uh, loss in uh, um, unrealized uh, lo uh, the losses, uh, unrealized losses from the government bond holding completely wiped out their tier one capital. So as a, lo a local bank doesn't have this problem, but still, uh, once we uh, adjust for this uh, unrealized losses, the many lo uh, regional banks have a very tiny capital. So in that sense that, uh, that local banks will suffer from this uh, higher cost of funding. So uh, there is a problem there. The uh, Swiss, uh, Swiss uh, uh, Credit Suisse is a unique, it's totally different, and I think it's less contagious. So uh, that is my tentative uh, assessment. Now, uh, before I talk about BOJ's policy, uh, let me uh, talk about my uh, assessment. Uh, by the way, I wrote an article for Nikkei uh, Keizai Kyoist this Tuesday, so you can look at that, it's in Japanese. Now, basically, I support for uh, greater um, flexibility, uh, with regards to BOJ's monetary policy, uh, basically I support uh, Sasaki-san, um, 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 but uh, at the same time, I think with the current, if the Ueda-san will stick to the 2% price stability target, this creates contradiction. Because uh, BOJ, uh, the um, mandate for the monetary policy is price stability, and as he said at the diet hearings, confirmation hearings, he said, the Bank of Japan's monetary policy mandate is price stability. And at this moment, price stability is set at 2%. And he supports 2% target. And, and then for many, many years, the Bank of Japan was not able to achieve price stability. So I will make effort for my five years, entire five years, to achieve this un, uh, unrealized goal. That is very strong statement. So as long as BOJ stick to the 2% target, I think any further adjustment uh, or maybe completely uh, abandoning the uh, yield YCC is extremely difficult and contradictory to this uh, the mandate. And therefore, I, uh, I suggested uh, from last year, in order to uh, um, increase the flexibility, uh, eventually uh, normalization of monetary policy, the only way uh, to do uh, in a, a consistent way is change 2% uh, inflation target and introduce to uh, in inflation tag uh, inflation target range such as from 1 to 1 to 3% or 0.5 to 2.5% and only uh, uh, under this inflation target range then there is no contradiction uh, with regards to this further uh, adjustment okay so this is my view so now now let next page next page so let me highlight what will be the issue here. So why it's not so easy for the BOJ to move away uh, from current policies. So by the way, so since this banking crisis happened uh, in United States and Europe, I think BOJ will maintain the uh, status quo for the extended period. Um, so this is adding the, uh, another reason for the BOJ to maintain the status quo. Next page, please. So, as I said, at, uh, at the diet, the, uh, the, in the statement, the statement, not the uh, response to the question, that in the statement, Mr. Weda clearly said, uh, the, uh, the objective of monetary policy is achieving 2%. And he said 2% target will be maintained to prevent the effective lower bound. This is a global, stability, uh, global standard and BOJ's responsibility. 
And so therefore, he said, current monetary easing will continue until significant improvement in underlying price development takes place. Next page, please. So now let's look at the data. So this is the corporate uh, price level. I want to show you a level rather than the growth rate and, uh, and then also CPI. Now, corporate prices, these are commodity prices. So, and then of course, it's a, a wholesale prices. It's, so it's rising much faster. And the consumer prices, because they also include services inflation, so it's much lower. So, but eventually, as you see, this corporate price, uh, prices still rising, but at a decelerated basis. So eventually, I think we will see a, a, you know, a further downward pressure in terms of uh, consumer prices. Uh, next page, please. Now, uh, this is the two, uh, 70 percent of uh, inflation hike come from food and energy. So let's look at on the left hand side. Uh, this is a, a, a corporate sector's uh, <clears throat> food prices. Uh, as opposed to consumer based consumer price based food prices so it's uh, gradually catching up so it i think it's just a matter of time so some uh, food manufacturers they still need to pass on the past increased cost onto their uh, retail prices but i think eventually we will start to see uh, such in, uh, you know, such behavior less and less but the biggest issue is on the right hand side so the energy prices there's a huge gap between wholesale prices and co consumer prices so because there was a gap so utility companies were uh, planning to raise the uh, prices so they are, therefore the government came in and then uh, provided subsidy so from february we started to see uh, uh, no growth in terms of uh, uh, energy utility prices okay but next please now What's most important is the underlying price indicators. So here I show uh, um, the global standard uh, core inflation, meaning uh, excluding not just the fresh food as BOJ does, but exclude all food and energies. And that is at this moment 1.9%. So from February, we will start to see a decline, this, a decline on this indicator. The most important indicator uh, to make judgment about underlying inflation in the Japan and globally is uh, services. Services inflation is at this moment 1.2 percent, uh, way below 2 percent, and so this is a uh, quite uh, uh, you know low. That is a problem. So uh, as long as we don't see uh, any uh, convergence towards 2 percent, it's very difficult to see 2 percent in stable manner. Uh, what another indicator is a long-term inflation expectation, break-even inflation, 10 years, uh, it's uh, below 1%. So uh, from this data, and also economic surveys say toward the end of this year, and clearly next year, inflation will be below 2%. It's very difficult for BOJ to say underlying inflation is in improving. So as Uedasan said, until a significant improve, improvement in underlying inflation takes place, he will maintain YCC. So I don't see how he can change the you know, the policies. Next page, please. So this is I compare the US 10-year break even inflation, so long-term inflation expectation, market pace, and Japan, you see the huge gap. So US uh, you know, uh, staying around 2%. So therefore, uh, uh, you know, Powell said, keeps saying the uh, inflation expectation is well anchored. It's very clear, but very different in the case of Japan. Next page. Okay. So uh, this is a uh, uh, BOJ's uh, you know, outlook, uh, medium outlook on inflation uh, this year and next year, vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis economists. And both expect that inflation will come down below 2%. So under this outlook, it's very difficult for the BOJ to normalize the monetary policy. Next page, please. Okay, but why market market expect you know normalization, you know, including Sasaki-san? And I personally feel uh, I support that. But why everybody, <laughs> at least market participant, still keep saying that BOJ will uh, make changes? It's because at the same time, Mr. Ueda kept emphasizing the side effect, especially like deteriorating market functionality. And so he said, so BOJ uh, took care of it from December last year by expanding uh, the 10-year target range to 0.5%, also introduced some kind of uh, open market operation and you know, uh, uh, some others. So he wants to see whether those uh, measures will be effective. And then he said, if underlying inflation 
uh, not favorable. So we don't see uh, any sign of achieving 2%. But so um, a powerful monetary easing have to be maintained. Then he said he will try to introduce some measures to cope with side effect. I think this created a lot of uh, you know expectation, but he didn't specify what he will do uh, to cope with the side effect. <coughs> Next page, please. Okay. So this is a Bank of Japan survey uh, uh, for from for the bond market participant. So this is the degree of market function, functionality in deteriorating significantly over one year. And it, this is a February data. And then unfortunately, uh, the market function hasn't improved despite the December, December major and January measures. So market expecting what weather will do to cope with side effect. Next page, please. So, and then, and then this yield differences between say 10 year and nine year and eight, eight years, uh, nine year uh, yield is higher than 10 years. So this is a called a distortion. That's why last December, Bank of Japan uh, um, expanded 10 year yield target range to cope with this distortion, but this still stays there. So the BOJ's, uh, these additional measures so far haven't really improved the market uh, dysfunction uh, side effect. Next page, please. Okay, and so this is just before this uh, last Friday's uh, banking problem uh, emerged globally. So this is a gap between ten-year uh, interest swaps, interest rate swap, and ten-year government yield. And so this upward pressure is suggesting that market is expecting the you know unwinding of the ten-year yield uh, yield um, you know, measures. So uh, there is a gap here. So and also we can say if ten-year uh, yield is uh, eliminated, like Sasaki san said, probably uh, if a market uh, 10 year yield will be around uh, around 1%. So that is fair balance. Okay, so therefore, maybe we don't need to worry about it. Uh, but uh, the question is, the government, the government continues to issue the government bond, right? Uh, are we saying, so this uh, fair value is assuming that uh, Bank of Japan will keep the huge outstanding JGB persistent, right? So that is one assumption. Another assumption, so government is increasing government bond, issuing in a government bond. The BOJ will not intervene. Then I think eventually 10 year yield uh, will start to go up. So I think that is a bit uh, risky. And uh, I don't know if the BOJ will take such kind of action of this complete removal of 10 year yield. Next page, please. Okay, so uh, okay, setting aside that, what option the BOJ will have in case they do normalization? So uh, I think one, uh, expanding 10-year EU target range to 1% is uh, quite, quite drastic, but I say it's 0 0.75. Uh, or maybe I think it's better to shorten the uh, uh, target maturity from 10-year to 5-year. And uh, I think that's much better because 10-year uh, EU already created a lot of distortion. <laughs> or uh, like he said, uh, no, uh, yeah, like he said, remove our 10 year yield control. And, uh, uh, or maybe what Reserve Bank of Australia did in 2021, uh, you know, um, automatic shortening of target maturity. What's happened is that Australia used to have a three year uh, yield control. And then uh, in, in 2021, uh, July, the uh, Australia uh, intentionally chose slightly uh, shorter maturity than three years. And then uh, uh, and a target on a particular uh, government bond brand, particular maturity. So only keeping a, a low interest rate on this particular brand. So this particular brand maturity will shorten uh, over time. So ab about two years and seven two years and seven months, uh, they can completely finish the uh, this yield control. That's what they did. But before that, uh, they achieve inflation targets, so they abandoned it. So that approach is also possible, also uh, where does I mention in the past. But applying this approach to the BOJ's case is a bit difficult because BOJ have 10 years. So if they uh, set the target to less than 10 years, are they going to keep uh, over these 10 years and uh, nearly 10 years, this automatic uh, shortening? Uh, it, they will, this will be subject to a lot of speculation. And then finally, I think it's now or later, they have to remove this negative interest rate. It's a little confusing because a BOJ <coughs> maintains zero point, uh, negative 0.1% interest rate. And at the same time, they try to uh, do a lot of measures to mitigate this adverse impact coming from, coming from negative interest rate. That is a bit confusing. So it's better to remove that. 
and just stick with uh, 0% and plus 0.1% interest rate on excess reserves. Next page. Okay, so here is my point. So if the BOJ will do some normalization, uh, that is good, I, I support, but keeping 2%. And we, if we don't see uh, any possibility of achieving 2% uh, anytime soon, I think it just creates a very difficult dilemma for the BOJ because it's completely against uh, price stability mandate. So that's why I say uh, the best way is to introduce inflation target range. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, all right, we'll, we'll turn to our final speaker, uh, Jesper Cole on my left. Uh, he's widely recognized as one of the top Japan strategists and economists, having worked as chief strategist and head of research for U.S. investment banks J.P. Morgan and Merrill Lynch. Uh, Jesper currently serves as expert director for the Monex Group and the Japan Catalyst Fund. Uh, Japan's first retail investor-based corporate engagement and activist fund. His analysis and insights have earned him a position on several Japanese government and corporate advisory committees, and he's an ambassador for FinCity Tokyo. He serves on the board of directors of OIST, which is the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, and the Asia Society Japan. He's an economist, angel investor, and he reminds us again, a Japan optimist. So I wonder whether you're going to be as optimistic as the other two speakers All, have been. <laughs> always too late to be pessimistic. Um, look, I mean, wow, exciting times, right? I mean, Sasaki-san, you, you and, and Shirai-san, remember 1995, the Jusen Mundai. Yes. This was a, the first sort of, of our generation, right? It was in Japan that we had sort of the first bank run. Right? And remember, there were pictures on NHK television, uh, I think it was in the summer, of some Oji-san carrying a box with 10,000 yen notes going through the streets of Osaka. Right? These were the good old times. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, well, you know, it's always the question, right? Is it a bank run by idiots or is it a bank run? By idiots, right? Um, so it's always this sort of little, little push and pull, and it's it's quite amazing actually how little um, psychology um, has changed. And uh, a good friend of mine reminded me recently, you know, bubbles are neither rational nor irrational; they're just human. I mean, that's part of human nature. We are trend followers. Um, I want in my remarks uh, just do uh, two things. Uh, one is sort of highlight um, where Japan is different um, from what's going on in uh, Silicon Bank in the United States right now. Um, and secondly, um, you know, follow on uh, to uh, my remarks uh, from my colleagues um, from what's going on here in Japan. Now, on what's different, right? And let's look at finance, psychology, and policy. Those are, I think, three very important things. Um, when you look at finance, well, interest rates go up, bad things happen. It's always the same. When the cost of capital, when the cost of money goes up, um, you know, things start to happen. Um, and obviously, in the classic textbook case, when interest rates go up, you've got the interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy, housing, durable goods purchases, credit card purchases, car purchases, slowing down. And that is exactly what has happened, actually, in the United States of America. But people forget that when interest rates go up, something else happens, and that is the impact on asset markets. When interest rates go up, the present value of future profits goes down. It's just simple discounting. And what that means is that all of a sudden, the true cash flow generation of any corporation becomes much, much more important. And this is where American technology companies, which obviously sell the dream of some future profit in the future, but really have negative cash flow, right, um, where they get hurt very much. There's an additional big difference to uh, Japan, which is that the way stock options share compensation um, is calculated. Remember, stock compensation is not cash flow. So as a result of that, when you look, for example, at the Russell 1000 technology companies, right, stock compensation for the technology companies is about 25% of cash flow. 
So if that were to be counted, right, as cash flow, you'd have a significant reduction there. It's 25% of cash flow for technology companies. It's three times higher than for the non-technology companies. So ironically, it's good that Japan doesn't have stock compensation and Japan doesn't have technology companies anymore. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, to give you a concrete example, Amazon's free cash flow would be one third lower if stock compensation were a cash flow event, right? So you see the difference here in terms of the basic finance over and above the fact that obviously interest rates in Japan have not gone up. Psychology. Um, you know, Shirai san and Sasaki san mentioned that the deposit base here in Japan is very, very stable. Um, you know, and banking in Japan still has a lot of friction. What we've learned over the last week, we've got a banking crisis at the speed of a tweet, right? I mean, this reduction in friction, right, that you can react to a tweet that makes you nervous by literally within a couple of seconds transferring a million dollars from your iPhone. Um, you know, there are no circuit breakers. Um, here in Japan, there still are significant circuit breakers, right, uh, that are in place. It just is not possible to transfer large sums of money, um, you know, uh, uh, via your iPhone. Um, and I think from a policy perspective, I think the big lesson here is whether the United States and other advanced economies actually are going to introduce some circuit breakers, right, um, you know, into uh, the what has become an increasingly frictionless banking system, right, um, with the with the ascent of uh, of e-commerce there. So Japan is different in the sense of that there may be a similar psychology or risk of psychology, but to actually act on that fear in terms of deposit withdrawal um, is just uh, you know much much more difficult. And then last but not least, let's not forget. The genesis, a big part of this crisis at Silicon Valley Bank, is deregulation enacted by the Trump administration in 2018, when mid-sized banks were exempt, right, from the Volcker rules, stricter rules, and as a result of that, right, it was able, actually possible, um, you know, for number one, the amount of leverage that Silicon Valley Bank, you know, was able to accumulate. And number two, it was not subject to the Federal Reserve's, um, you know, stress testing regime, which, um, you know, is exactly what that lobbying effort in 2008, which was led by Silicon Valley Bank, actually led to a deregulation and actually made the U.S. banking system, um, you know, forget the lessons that were supposedly learned uh, by the great financial crisis. So you see the point, Japan is different. Um, you know, the basic finance are different. The psychology and friction in the banking system is different. And, you know, you've got the policy side of event. And by the way, that's why I'm not worried about the European banking system, because the European banking system, like the Japanese banking system, actually still does have a lot of friction. So Credit Suisse, I think, is an isolated case. I mean, they've been in trouble uh, for basically already, um, you know, uh, many years uh, in the past. So that's sort of on the, glo on the global side of things. Um, quickly, um, you know, switching gears, um, you know, back to Japan and dovetailing to, um, you know, what, um, you know, um, Sasaki-san and Shirai-san uh, sort of mentioned. Uh, a couple of things. I think, and I've learned the hard way through investing, um, you know, in Japan, um, that what matters is nominal GDP. It's not the CPI, it's not the deflator, it's not the corporate goods price indices. All of these indications have value, but what actually matters is nominal income. Um, you know, and obviously at the core of that is uh, human capital, um, is wages. And I think that when you look at the fundamentals in Japan, it's not your fault, not my fault. Um, you know, we started the year with Japan's richest man, Mr. Yanai, offering a 40% increase in pay. And we now are at the tail end of the Shunto negotiations. And it looks that many of the heavy players are increasing base pay by between six, seven, eight, nine percent This is a significant change, a huge inflection. And it does mean that actually the primary part of the domestic economy, which is the Japanese household sector, actually for the first time in literally one generation 
is actually starting to see you know, an increase um, in nominal income, nominal pay. Um, and on top of that, you find that you know, it's not just investment in human capital, but it's also investment in productive capital right, um, that is increasing. As you know very well from all the survey data, from everything that we know, um, you know from individual corporations, uh, investment in uh, productive capital is actually starting to increase here in Japan. It is aided by DX, it is aided by GX, it is aided by friend shoring, you know, but the key issue is that in the primary factors of productions, human capital and productive capital, for the first time in one generation, it looks like there is a self-sustaining virtuous cycle that is actually coming through. What does that mean? Um, you know, I would be uh, the outlier here. Um, I think that the Japanese nominal GDP is going to be growing, you know, between 3 and 4%. Um, and that as a result of that, by Christmas time, I expect the 10-year bond yield to be between 1.5 and 2% still below the nominal growth rate, but you know, significantly from uh, where we are today, and that's because of the um, fundamental domestic demand developments uh, that are actually going on. That's just an outlook here. Um, on the new team, a uh, couple of comments. Um, Ueda Sensei is now the only economist, right, uh, as the head of a central bank, right? Uh, everybody else is something something. Um, <laughs> And it's interesting, anybody who's ever met Ueda Sensei, I mean, he's a pragmatist, right? He's not a dogmatist. He's not from the Chicago school. He's not from the Keynesian school. He is a pragmatist who builds very sound theoretical uh, uh, underpinnings, but is not afraid to change his mind, um, you know, when the facts, when the data change, right? So I think that that's very, very important that the sort of pragmatist, uh, you know, uh, 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 tradition uh, that Japan can pride itself on, uh, you know, actually continues. Um, in my personal opinion, um, I think an often overlooked element of the task at hand um, is actually reflected in the choice of deputy governor, right? Where we have a break with tradition because it's not a proper Ministry of Finance person, but it is Mr. Himino, who was the head of the FSA, the Financial Supervisory Agency, right? And this is very, very important because in my understanding, the primary task at the high level policymaking is now to sort out, to clean up Japan's secondary banking system. Right? The regional banks, the credit unions, the credit cooperatives. Right, We know Japan has a very strong primary banking system, well capitalized, good risk management, etc. But the secondary banking system, the regional banks, the credit cooperatives, credit unions, that's something that needs to be consolidated. And I think the fact that Himino-san, as the former head of the FSA, what does that mean? If you're the head of the primary regulator, you know where all the corpses are buried, right? Um, interesting, I think uh, Shirai-san mentioned about the exposure um, that regional banks have. Um, obviously, domestic interest risk is one thing, but you know there are estimates out there that uh, the regional banks sit on about 1.4 trillion yen um, of uh, unrealized losses on their foreign bond portfolio. Right? So there are issues right, that could help speed up the consolidation here, but over and above this debate about interest rate policy, I think that uh, you know, sor sorting out uh, the Japanese secondary banking system, I think is gonna be the big task and also a big opportunity uh, here in Japan. In another speech somewhere, I recently said, you know, this was slightly jokingly in front of the k um, I said, you know, the, the point of Mr. Ueda and his new team is to make Japan's banks strong again. Because this is important, right? Banks can make money on their core business, right? If you have a yield cap control, you can't make interest, net interest margin, right? If you do allow a steeper yield curve, right, you do actually get net interest margins to start to grow. And if I'm right, and you actually do have business investment and investment in human capital going on, uh, then you've got volume of loans um, also coming through here. Um, 30 seconds, um, I think, on the risk 
of the normalization policy, right? And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, because the Japanese economy, I think, uh, is in a virtuous cycle now, with nominal incomes, nominal GDP growing nicely for the first time uh, in 20, 25 years, um, you know, that, um, you know, allowing for a steeper yield curve, I think, is coming through. The risk, I think, is that we are finding a competition or rekindled competition uh, between the Ministry of Finance wanting to hike taxes and the Bank of Japan needing to normalize Japan's interest rate policy. As you know, Prime Minister Kishida has committed to a lot of programs. He's doubling defense expenditure as a mm. share of GDP. Mm. He is spending 130 trillion yen on GX, on green finance. Uh, he's committing 10 trillion yen to deep university. He is adding support to zombie companies as well as um, you know, supporting, uh, uh, protecting uh, uh, consumers against the supply shock of higher energy and higher food prices. All of this stuff costs money, and it's nice that Mr. Kishida told us on December 19, so I promise not to increase taxes before the next election. Uh, that's very comforting. Uh, but of course, the race, you know, um, between the Ministry of Finance looking to increase taxes, and whether it's corporate taxes, whether it is direct income taxes, whether it is, uh, you know, the consumption tax, we will see, and I loved Sasaki-san's little timeline of the window, right? What is, over the next six months, you know, what is Mr. Ueda's wiggle room? Well, it'll be exactly in June, July, August, right? that the balloons on future tax policy are going to start to be, to be floated. So, you know, that's sort of one thing I think that I wanted to point out, that you do have, you know, monetary policy here in Japan not acting in isolation, that there is fiscal policy, um, you know, that is going to become more demanding in terms of the calls for fiscal consolidation, including tax increases, mm -hmm. likely to become an issue as we move into the late summer, early autumn. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you, Jasper. Very interesting point you made at the end, I think. Um, I mean, does that imply a recession for Japan, I wonder? But um, before I open the floor to questions, I'd just like to get one question in about um, possible impacts on exchange rates, the yen exchange rate. Um, if central banks are going to be pausing in their um, rate hiking, which seems likely, then the yield differential between foreign uh, bonds and Japanese bonds will um, not widen. So what is likely to be the, the impact of these changing influences on the yen exchange rate? Just very briefly, Mr. Sakisen, do you have any view on, the, on that? Yes. Uh, no. Basically, uh, in terms of the yen, if we are just focusing on the yen as general, uh, what is most important is that uh, uh, the uh, short-term yield gap between Japan and the rest of the world. Yeah. So uh, unless the other central banks start cutting the interest rate, the yen will remain the weak currency. For example, the, uh, the policy rate differential between Japan and the rest of the world the rest of the world is the average policy rate on the rest of the world, is now approaching to the 400 base point, mm. which is the highest since 2007, when the yen carry trade was active. Actually, that was the peak, mm. the 400 base point was a peak at that time. So now the short-term interest rate between Japan and the rest of the world is historical high. So as long as uh, this level uh, remains the same, uh, yen will remain the weak currency. It cannot be a strong currency. And at the same time, sorry, uh, just one, I'd like to add one mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Japan now has a uh, trade deficit. We have never uh, had a, this kind of uh, a situation. We have both trade deficit and uh, such a big short-term yield gap. So now is a, the yen is a kind of situation, in the, the worst situation in, in the current uh, recent history. So no real? No really big change. Then. Actually, uh, they, uh, I think I would say the yen remains a weak currency. So, yeah. uh, you know, if we talk about the dollar yen, uh, it also the depends on the dollar. So uh, if the dollar starts going lower, dollar yen will maybe a little bit uh, going lower, mm. uh, but uh, it's unlikely to see that such a the big okay. depreciation okay. in dollar yen. Shirai-san, I think you wanted to say something right on that. So 
I think if we look at the uh, US dollar uh, Japanese yen development, uh, since uh, uh, um, November last year, I think things changed dramatically. Because until uh, end of October, the, uh, when the Fed, Fed, uh, Fed was increasing federal fund rate, the uh, long term, like 10 year uh, yield, was also rising in the US. But because uh, uh, as the interest rate started to pick up, people started to worry about uh, um, growth exp uh, 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 economic growth. And also, US inflation started to come down, and inflation expectations started to stabilize. Mm. So US uh, long term interest rate started to go down. That was a, a turning point that we started to see a, a data weakness overall. Now, uh, right now, you know, um, it's yen data rate is so volatile, but one thing is clear is the U.S. economy, uh, a lot of, um, you know, um, data right now is showing some, uh, um, um, some uh, econ economic growth that's slowing down in U.S. Mm. And also, right now, the U.S. banking program, so I don't think U.S. data can be that, uh, will not be that strong. So mm -hmm. having this uh, having this kind of situation, probably it's uh, the chance that it, the, the chance that yen get uh, more appreciated will be much higher than the situation before uh, uh, October. Okay, thank you, Jasper. Do you want to add anything briefly on that? Or? Yeah, I'm I'm more of a dollar bull, um, and I actually think that um, you know what we will. I mean, I, th I think that the, 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 the fears of a banking crisis in the United States certainly are very much overblown. Um, I actually think that the, the, the reaction by the policymakers has been quite remarkable. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, what you now find is that U.S. assets uh, are starting to become cheap. Um, I think we had the CEO, the president of Hitachi, um, you know, in the media a couple of weeks ago sort of saying we're looking to buy American software engineers. Um, you know, and, you know, if you have, um, you know, Japanese, uh, sorry, American, uh, you know, startups now becoming cheap uh, because of uh, seizure uh, of American funding, um, you know, Japanese institutions sort of stepping in there, um, I think is quite likely. I also think that, um, you know, that the inflation issue in the United States of America, I think that the, the inflation issue is much, much more fundamental um, and I think that, um, you know, the, uh, 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 the break uh, applied via higher interest rates, um, I think, is going to continue. So I, I personally think that, uh, uh, you know, U.S. policy rates going up, the interest rate differential continuing to widen. Um, the wild card is something that Sasaki-san pointed out, right? The wild card is whether Japan's trade and current account, right? Um, now, uh, you know, in the rearview mirror, we obviously had the widening deficit because of rising import prices and exports being hurt. Um, now, exports are now beginning to increase because of the opening of the People's Republic of China. And let's not forget, uh, China is Japan's largest export partner. It's not the United States of America. So, you know, the traction from Japanese capital goods companies as well as consumer goods companies supplying more to the People's Republic of China, that together with imports basically being stable, if not falling a little bit, um, you know, could very well turn the Japanese trade balance around. Mm -hmm. And when that starts to happen, um, I think Sasaki-san and I will switch and uh, become a little bit more bullish uh, on the Japanese yen again. It's interesting. At the margin, obviously, it's not just the trade balance, but obviously the big thing over the next three months is to watch whether exports from Japan to the People's Republic of China actually do go up, right? Um, and then already we do know that the impact uh, on the currency from inbound tourism, right, at the margin is actually very real, right? Where now we're basically back to about 75, 80% of pre-COVID capacity, right? But with more people expected to come in as airlines open up further, um, you know, at the margin, that's gonna give a little bit of demand for the Japanese currency as well. Okay, let's turn to <coughs> questions. Do we have any questions from the floor? Um, no questions on the floor? Yes, Martin. Martin Kölling, Handelsblatt. Um, we were talking ab on, uh, about the impact on the yen. Uh, there, there's also the impact on Japanese debt. Mm. Uh, I wonder what's going to happen there. When, for 
ages, basically, there's always a talk about the risk of a debt crisis in Japan when Japan will become the next Greece or whatever. Um, so where are we standing now on the risk scale and when will it become dangerous for Japan? So, so the question is addressed to everyone. I would say the, uh, the level of the danger is ticking up, but I'm uh, not sure when that will become a really serious problem. Uh, obviously, you know, the Japan's, uh, the, si the size of debt is significantly increasing, significant size. And then what is different right now is that uh, at least I, I can agree with the uh, yes person that the Japan, Japan's inflation rate or maybe the uh, wage level is picking up. So that means that the inflation rate is going up. So the uh, debt service, uh, the coupon payment is likely to keep increasing. So uh, the gradually it's you know, uh, increasing. But at the same time, the BOJ is having holding the more than 50% of the JGB. So uh, once the BOJ uh, normalized the uh, monetary policy, so that will uh, co cause a trouble uh, again, again. So uh, yeah, I, I don't think that, that, that something will happen very soon country uh, so soon, but uh, I think the, the danger level is picking, tip picking up. Okay, yes, sir, please. Okay, so right now uh, Japanese public debt to nominal GDP ratio is 260%. And last year's uh, Japan's fiscal balance as a percent of a nominal GDP was around so negative 6%, which was the uh, biggest negative among G7. So uh, the, the, uh, that's one issue. So uh, because uh, you know, the debt is growing, and uh, before, uh, you know, um, Kuroda did this QQE, the 10 year yield was moving around 0.75 to 1%. So uh, fair value right now, 10 year yield is probably around 1%. Uh, but as I said to, uh, to Sasaki-san, if the BOJ uh, will abandon uh, YCC, that kind of fair value is assuming that BOJ will maintain this 52% of Japanese government debt. Mm -hmm. They are not going to sell it, just keep it, right? So as of today, if the BOJ abandoned 10 year yield, uh, because BOJ is not going to sell it, just keep it and then continue reinvestment. So uh, having uh, under that assumption, probably uh, 10 year yield will be around 1%. So my question was then, what will happen after? Because the government is increasing the spending so uh, deficit continues, so debt will accumulate, right? So if the BOJ completely abandon uh, y uh, YCC, I mean, uh, 10 year yield, then, then in the meanwhile, the government is increasing this uh, issuance, right? So that will give an upward pressure on the 10 year mm -hmm. yield. And once people, at this moment, nobody worry about Japan's uh, debt crisis. And, but if people start to worry about it, then we don't know what will happen to these upward pressures. By the way, since December and January, the foreign uh, investor uh, sold out the Japanese long-term bond because they worry about loss coming from BOJ's normalization. Mm. So they shifted from long-term government bonds to short-term. So right now, because BOJ continued, uh, BOJ purchased a lot uh, last December and, and uh, January, so it offset. But what if the BOJ will completely abandon it? Uh, I think we have to think about the implication uh, on that. Mm. Just, 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 just for 30 seconds, it's, 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 um, it's very interesting I mean, to say something positive, right? Um, <laughs> the tax system in Japan is actually working now. Um, you've had now you know, this shift away from direct taxation towards indirect taxation. Uh, the tax base is now much more balanced one-third income tax, one-third corporate tax, and one-third indirect taxes, right? And actually, the MOF, um, you know, has now, for four years running, uh, tax revenues actually came in above what the original budget was, 
right? So it's quite interesting that actually it took a long time, right? But ironically, um, you know, they're the multiplier of, you know, if, you know, Sasaksen and I were right, and nominal incomes actually start to increase, nominal GDP growth actually starts to increase, you could actually see the tax multiplier, you know, very much surprising on the upside, right? Um, that certainly is something in there. Um, you know, the other thing is, you know, about the debt crisis. Um, I mean, Sasaksen, you may remember, remember when, when we were on the trading floor and, uh, you know, for the first time government bond yields in Japan went below 3%, and we had George Soros on the speakerphone, right? And he was, you know, nobody deserves to borrow for less than 3% short. <laughs> well, you know, it was the widowmaker trade, right? Um, and why is that? And this is an intellectually very, very important uh, 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 issue, right? We have a savings glut globally. I mean, for every one yen of fiscal debt that Japan took out over the last five years, the private sector has created three yen of savings. Ben Bernanke, right? Um, God bless him, right? Um, you know, his most interesting paper is this savings glut paper from the 1990s. It's just a reality that we're living with. Right? So as a German, it pains me to say that because you're supposed to go to fiscal uh, uh, heaven right, by having a nicely balanced budget. Right? But the reality is that in the 21st century, given where we are, given that we do have excess savings, right, I certainly am not worried about a crisis. I would be worried about a crisis if Japan were the only country in the world that does this. Right? Um, but basically every country in the world Right, is running very, very similar fiscal policies. And so as a result of that, the overall equilibrium status, um, you know, I don't think changes very much. Um, final anecdote, um, you know, of course, my friends at the Ministry of Finance you know, are very eager to have you know, Mr. Ueda increase interest rates because they think Ueda is the only person, higher interest rates is the only person who can rein in Prime Minister Kishida's largesse with fiscal financing. <laughs> okay. Um, any more questions from the floor? Yes, um, Patrick. Hello, Patrick Welter, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Let me try this question. If you look to the United States and if you look to Europe, obviously the inflation was absolutely underrated by the central banks, and they both have confessed that they were wrong. If you look to Japan, everybody tells us inflation is going to stay long, uh, is going to stay low. On the other hand, you have a lot of stories about prices rising first time in decades. You have stories about the price rises widening if you mm. look to consum consumer goods. So the question to all three of us, how sure are you that this prognosis that projection that the inflation in Japan is going to stay low, that is really going to happen, yeah. or are we up to some kind of surprise as we had in the EU and in the US? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yes, by all means, please, please. Okay, so for example, right now inflation is above 4% headline, and the so Japan- Chasen, could you speak into the microphone? So right now, you know, when we look at inflation, we have to ask whether we are talking about headline or Japan's uh, uh, you know, core inflation, which means excluding fresh food. But if we take global stand, exclude all food, um, not just fresh food, all food and uh, uh, energy, it's just 1.9%. That's why, uh, although uh, BOJ's core inflation is 4%, BOJ say underlying inflation is weak, uh, very far away from 2%. Okay, so in that sense, uh, from that, uh, I also showed you some underlying inflation. I don't, I, I don't see they, uh, that super central will be achieved in stable manner. Uh, I'm BOJ, same, same view. This is the same idea that I was in Germany. Sorry. Hmm? This is the same argument that I was in Germany in the Yeah. Yeah, uh, but they look at uh, underlying inflation, and that is way above. That's why they have to lower it by raising interest rate. But Japan hasn't reached to that level. Okay. So, do you want to say something about inflation? Uh, I, I is it r realistic? Or not? Actually, uh, I, I think the situation in Japan has changed uh, already. Uh, so, uh, I, I feel like uh, I, I think we, Japan, will start having a certain level of the inflation going forward. 
The first thing I, I like to highlight is that the, the Japanese company has been absorbing the higher cost uh, from the outside the country. Uh, and then you know, that's why the Japan's uh, inflation rate still remains low. But uh, it is true that the import price or wholesale price, is, as uh, Shirai san uh, shows the chart, is already high. So now Japanese company has been absorbing the high cost now and they start giving the uh, consumer. And then uh, the, 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 uh, what I want to uh, mention is that now Japan, I don't know how to say in English, hard, insti hard in instinct. Hard instinct. Like, you know, people are watching the, uh, the, uh, the others, and mm -hmm. once the others start moving, uh, they start moving. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So uh, now the Japanese corporate starts hiking the price mm. because the other company starts hiking the price. So now it's a start moving. And also I like to uh, point out one more thing, one last thing is that the wage. I think that uh, Japanese uh, wage uh, will continue to go up because I mean, they have to, because lack of the people. Now, you know, people are, I mean, we are having, we are saying that the you know, Japanese population is decreasing but uh, now, in the time, we start feeling that in the labor market. Now, for example, the uh, population in 20s is about 80% of that of the 60s. So now we start feeling that the, there is a less young people. But uh, the population between 10-year-old and 19-year-old uh, is just 60% of the uh, 50s. So 10 years later, mm -hmm. the lack of the labor, I mean, the people is getting severe and severe. And after 10 years, that number is become uh, 50%. So uh, basically, uh, we, and also one more thing is that, uh, you know, Japan's wage level is already low, even compared to Korea. Korea's uh, wage level is higher. So now uh, we, we don't have uh, many people in Japan, uh, many young people to in the work, workforce. And also we cannot rely on the foreign countries. So eventually we have to uh, hike, the, hike the wage. To hike the wage, the company has to hike the price. Mm -hmm. So I think that that kind of uh, uh, movement is start moving. So I'm actually very bullish on the uh, Japan's inflation rate. Okay. I mean, sa same here. I think that you know there's 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 plenty of reasons, right, for why central bankers, you know, um, I mean, their job ultimately is to be complacent. And then their job also is to all of a sudden change their minds and surprise markets. I mean, when a central bank can no longer surprise, then you've got a real problem. Um, sorry, uh, not to be facetious here. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, sort of the, 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 the Japan is very good at, um, you know, dealing with supply shocks via fiscal measures, right? And the government can actually intervene much faster than in Europe and, you know, the Americans don't intervene to begin with, right? Um, but, um, you know, the demand pull evidence, right, um, is only just beginning to actually come through, right? And if we're right and this wage normalization, um, you know, demand pull from domestic people actually is coming through, right? I mean, I certainly, you know, as I, as I indicated with my nominal GDP forecast, right, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the, the inflation here is not transient, but inflation here is structural. Um, you know, and the structural upshift, and be my guest whether that manifests itself with a with a two percent CPI or with a three percent CPI. You know, ultimately, I'm I'm reasonably agnostic about the whole thing, right? But the key issue is that nominal uh, sales is actually starting to come uh, 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 is is actually starting to rise. Um, you know, quite significantly, and as Sasaki san points out, you know, it is now okay to pass pass on costs. Right now, what this will do, which is really interesting, um, and I got thrown out of the, the, the prime minister's office the other day. Um, no, that's not true. But um, <laughs> no, because like the, the data point I'm most interested in now is bankruptcies, right? Because when costs go up, right, and the consensus is broken that you actually pass on your costs, right? Um, that means that those companies without a vision, without a proper plan, right? Um, are going to actually, uh, you know, uh, go kaput. That their uh, human capital, um, you know, is going to flee to other companies that actually do have a plan, that do have proactive investments. Um, and so from that perspective, I think, uh, you know, now over the next year, 
I think the most interesting data point is actually going to be bankruptcies uh, to actually see, right, whether the cost push that is coming through, where some companies have price power, but other companies don't have price power, right, that as a result of that, you know, you actually are going to start to see a weeding out of the inefficient of the zombie companies here in Japan. Okay. Uh, yes, we've got two hands raised. Oh, sorry, this gentleman here, you haven't had... Oh. Um, Oh, you want to say something more? Yeah. Uh, sorry, yes, please. Um, you know, I have no question that inflation will be uh, have a uh, will be much higher than um, before uh, pre COVID um, before COVID nineteen pandemics happen because of this aging. We have labor shortage uh, because uh, China's uh, also have a de uh, declining. Uh, labor force, so production costs are much higher, geographic uh, uh, risk and uh, diversification production all leads to the higher inflation. But what's important is most of those, you know, uh, inflation pressure, uh, include, including the uh, labor shortage in Japan, are supply side. It's not demand driven. So like look at right now. So Japan's inflation is uh, around 4%. Uh, most of them uh, are from supply side, but demand is weak. If you look at household survey in real terms, because of the higher prices in food, the real consumption in food is dropping. The, uh, the, right now, the, the only uh, consumption item which we see a stable consumption growth is services, because services dropped to the lowest level after COVID-19, and they, it didn't recover, so it finally started to pick up. So services is a driving force, but other, uh, other, other uh, you know, items are very weak. So the most likely scenario in the future is that, yes, we will have a higher inflation than the past, but that is mostly because of this uh, labor shortage uh, or like uh, you know, higher production cost in China, uh, green, uh, the climate change and so on, but demand remains weak. So, if, so just exactly uh, look at what's happening now. So BOJ say inflation is high, but mostly commodity and supply side, demand is so weak, so it's not demand-driven inflation. The likely scenario is this. So in the future, we also continue to see a higher inflation, mostly from uh, nothing to do with demand, but labor shortage and supply side. It's a gross constraint. Then demand is weak, so BOJ will say, okay, so demand is weak, we have to support with low interest rate, so monetary easing has to be continued. That is a likely scenario. Okay. All right. Yes, this gentleman here first, if you could, uh, and then please in identify yourself at yes, the microphone. Uh, I'm associate member, exec uh, retired mm. executive, name is Ikubo, and my question is not directly related to the subject today, but I would like to, uh, to ask three of you that uh, what is the weaknesses of the Japanese companies or organization? And uh, we must, and uh, if, you, if you care to, co to come up with the remedies to overcome this, I'd appreciate that. Big question. Thank you. What are the weaknesses of the Japanese companies organization and what remedies are, I don't know exactly how you're going to tackle that, but um, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So yesterday I was uh, having this uh, private uh, working study group, and then there was a speaker came from uh, the female uh, sort of a uh, uh, non-executive directors. You know, right now we have this corporate governance reform in Japan. So at the board, uh, you know, they like to have a lot of female uh, non-executive. Uh, directors and also the somebody who have a uh, management experience. So idea of this corporate governance reform started from 2015 under, uh, uh, under Abenomics was to increase corporate sector's earning capacity. But the problem is that that hasn't changed. The Japan's uh, earning, pro uh, earning uh, you know, powers remain weak. Uh, of course, there was uh, some time, there was uh, some pickup, but if you uh, smoothen it, uh, there is no uh, strong uh, improvement, and also still a huge gap uh, uh, compared to U.S. Company uh, companies. So this corporate uh, governance reform, changing to the Western-style, uh, you know, board structure, uh, she also admitted, uh, so far has no impact on earning capacity. 
And then you know what's happening, the uh, FSA, Financial Services Agency, recently said uh, the PBR, price book ratio, and about 40% of listed companies, PBR is below one. It means uh, the CEO have to, feel, have to feel ashamed that shareholders are not appreciating the corporate sector's uh, uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. So nothing has changed. And this is very, very Japan unique. So going back to the wage, yes, so wage this year will be high. There's a uh, momentum. But given that the aging society, Japanese uh, sales is not going to go up. Uh, and, and, then, and so they have to seek for that, you know, uh, a lot of profit from foreign countries. And uh, I see a very domestic-oriented tons of Japanese companies. And how are they going to maintain 3% wage loss every year? Mm. Can I yeah, sorry, sure, sure, just, just interject there? Um, and and I'm, I'm going to contradict you um, because, um, <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, if you look at the data since 1992 uh, in Japan, sales growth is zero. Top line growth has been zero since 1992, okay? But uh, profits are up 11 times, okay? Uh, in the United States, since 1992, sales are up three times and profits are up six times. Not bad, but on zero sales growth over two decades, your earnings go up by 11 times. As far as I'm concerned, that's the Nobel Prize for Applied Economics. <laughs> the problem is you don't invest in sales. You ask what the problem is with Japanese companies. Let me give an example. Panasonic, right? 10 years ago, 15 years ago, Panasonic was the king of batteries. Tesla did not exist without Panasonic. There were no Chinese, there were no Korean competitors at the top level battery production. Why did Panasonic accumulate 1.5 trillion yen of retained earnings rather than invest to become and not to become, not to become, to stay mm. the number one player. What happened to your, as they say in technical terms at the Harvard Business School, cojones, sorry, to your yashin, to your animal spirits to actually maintain the number one plus. The biggest problem that Japanese companies have if you look at Seicho Toshi, right, if you look at business investment expenditure, right, this has been lagging business investment expenditure everywhere else in the world. And it's not for lack of capital. There's plenty of capital, as is evidenced by the relentless accumulation of retained earnings, which is idiotic management for all intents and purposes. So what are Japanese companies la lacking? It's not capital. It simply is the will to be the number one, number two, number three player in the world. I think okay. we are consistent, no? OK. Um, <laughs> we are not agreeing, disagreeing. Yeah, uh, I, I just like, like uh, add one thing. Uh, I think uh, the there is, we start seeing that the kind of solution, uh, what the uh, yes person mentioned, uh, now the DSC uh, stock exchange uh, start uh, watching the uh, this level of the PBR as uh, Shreya mentioned that the uh, nearly half of the company is uh, the PBR is uh, less than fifty percent. I mean one less than one. So uh, now the stock exchange uh, start asking uh, uh, to show the improvement of uh, that, which means that they, you know, they they have to increase the ROE. So I think the uh, the problem just as person mentioned uh, will improve going forward, so that may, may change the Japanese company. Okay, uh, gentlemen there, please, yes. And then if you could identify yourself, please. To my, friend. my name is uh, Gumnani, associate member. One question, what is your concern regarding current world events, especially banking? Number two, do you feel there'll be a run on the exchange like last year autumn when it ran to 150? Your, sorry, the question was, what is your interpretation what of the SVB? Uh, what, is, what is your concern regarding current world event, especially banking crisis? Yeah, and, and also the, like, uh, in terms of the currency market. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I, I feel the, uh, mm, the risk about the uh, yen depreciation uh, as associated from the banking system is now that uh, actually the, the downgrade of the Japanese sovereign, risk, sovereign credit mm -hmm. 
uh, downgrade itself uh, is not so problem for the Japanese government because they are, uh, if something happens, the BOJ will become a buyer. Uh, so uh, BOJ may support the uh, JGB. But uh, if the uh, Japan is downgraded, uh, that will cause the problem for the banking system. Now Japan, Japanese banks increase, has incre have increased uh, the foreign denominated loans. And then most of the foreign de denominated loans is financed by the uh, funding from the market. So if the, uh, the uh, sovereign ratings downgraded, the uh, banks will face the difficulty of funding from the market. Mm. If that happens, the, the situation was something like uh, the Japan premiums in late 90s. So if that happens, the basically maybe Japanese corporate yeah. needs to buy dollar. So that will cause the much higher dollar yen. So I think they, uh, the risk is something like that. Uh, Sarah, do you wish to say anything on that? Or quickly? Yeah, so quickly. if this, uh, uh, right now, uh, Japan's uh, uh, sovereign uh, JGB credit rating is single A, right? So there's a two notch to go uh, before to, uh, B level. So, uh, yeah, like he said, uh, government, you know, is okay. Uh, they can deal with it. But the problem is that if the downgrading happens, corporate sector financing will be uh, much higher not to mention our uh, banking sector. So th that is the issue. That's why we need to have a consolidation of this uh, debt. Okay. Yeah. Just for quickly. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not worried. I believe that glo global central bankers and global policymakers, um, you know, as, as much as it pains me to say, are actually pretty much on the ball here. And they're not Old Testament. They are New Testament. Um, you know. So um, what I do worry about is the People's Republic of China, um, you know, which is not transparent. Nobody knows what's going on, how decisions are being made. And the reason I'm worried about it potentially is that uh, there is an argument that you can make that uh, China is now where Japan was in the mid-1990s in the sense that you've got the traditional policy levers, right, of monetary policy, interest rate cuts, of fiscal policy, increased spending, no longer working to boost the economy. And um, you know we're obviously having right now a revival in China because of the end of the COVID policies, right? But if in five or six months it becomes clear that that was just temporary, um, the risk and what I cannot, but sometimes I wake up at night, um, you know, is China being forced to devalue its currency. If China's traditional policies do not work by the end of this summer, early autumn, right? I think the temptation and the risk for the People's Republic of China to devalue the renminbi by 20 or 30 percent would be very high, and that would obviously have very, very negative implications for the competitiveness of Japanese, uh, you know, suppliers, because Japanese suppliers effectively compete head to head with a lot of the Jap with a lot of the Chinese companies. Okay, actually, I, I have one more question, but Martin, you had your hand raised. Uh, can you a brief question, please? Because uh, I, <laughs> is we coming up on time? The question, the question might be brief. The answers maybe not. So <laughs> I don't know. Well, okay. Let's start um, we are talking about basically about a shift, uh, a paradigm shift in the Japanese economy. What is the impact on the stock market? What stocks will, should we invest in, for example? <laughs> and uh, then another question is, we were talking about many issues, but we didn't talk about productivity, which is also a factor uh, in uh, determining uh, wage growth. So what is, are you expecting on this front? Okay. Just be, maybe you want to lead off on that. Um. So, so you, you've, you've been handed a gift, you know, over the last week um, by the fact that the Japanese bank shares, uh, you know, got uh, herded into the global downdraft. Uh, but I think you'll find that in terms of investment sectors, uh, I think that Japanese banks, um, you know, are going to be very, very, um, you know, good uh, investment. In, in generally, I think Japanese financials uh, are going to be doing very well. Uh, and the reason is that ultimately a financial institution can only be as good as its customers. Um, and the domestic customers are actually getting stronger, are actually getting better. Um, productivity 
um, you know, comes from investment, uh, investment in human capital and in productive capital. That's exactly what's going on. And as a result of that, you know, if this cycle that has been in evidence over the last year and a half is sustained, you'll actually end up with upward revisions to Japan's potential growth rate, right? Uh, which right now most people sort of think is somewhere around half a percent. Um, you know, that being revised up to one, one and a half percent. Um, as a result of the in increasing investment in uh, productive capital as well as human capital. Final point on that, by the way, just very quickly, since you warned us that the answers were going to be long and you should never ask a German. Um, <laughs> the interesting thing, in my opinion, is not just the fact that wages are going up, it's the fact that you've got uh, dinosaur companies um, you know, of the establishment beginning to change to introduce genuine pay for performance. Right? What is happening at NTT, right, which is one of the most unionized companies in Japan, and they actually beginning to shift from the 1st of April towards genuine pay for performance and doing away with seniority-based pay, that, I think, is where the productivity miracle is going to be coming from. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, okay, so... Uh, just quickly, uh, we like, we like, we like uh, uh, finance sector, uh, same, uh, the reason is the same with uh, Espenson, and also the, especially we expect that the steep yield curve, that would be a net benefit for the finance sector. And also we like uh, uh, transportation sector because of the uh, increase expectation, increase inbound. Okay, okay. very good. Yeah. Okay. So we, to, to increase the uh, productivity, the Japanese company needs to put more money uh, for the investment and innovations, and also to increase stock prices. Actually, in Japanese stock prices are low because sales to profit ratio remain low. So again, uh, pro uh, product, uh, profitability is very important. Okay, if our speakers will indulge us with just three more minutes, I, I want to ask a question. We've not touched about on the psychology of investment in high-tech AI and so on. This collapse of um, SVB Bank, um, I mean, until now, everyone has thought investment in these AI sector and so on, it's been the, the place where everyone wants to be. Well, um, I just wonder whether you have any views on whether the climate um, of toward psychology towards investment in, in AI and other high-tech areas could be adversely affected, including here in Japan, which is trying to put a lot of emphasis now on, on high tech, by this, uh, these events at, at um, SVB and uh, possibly other banks. So, um, again, just for, uh, if you want to just... No, I, 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 I'm, no, in, in the sense, this is not a tech problem. Mm. This is a banking problem, and this is a risk management problem, and this is a policy problem as policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, banking. Now, you know, I think that for in Silicon Valley Bank, I mean, look, it's funny. You, do, you look at Silicon Valley Bank. I mean, this was a great bank, mm -hmm. right, in terms of everybody loved it because it was actually, it's Sasaki-san and I with Shirai-san. You know, we set up a venture, right? It's not easy to get a bank account. It's not easy to do banking. And they loved to do banking with us. Also, then, we made a little bit of money. We were successful. Mm -hmm. Sasaki-san and Shirai-san want to take out a mortgage to build a home. The Silicon Valley Bank would supply that mm -hmm. on the on the expectations that our venture was going to be doing well. I mean, it was actually you know quite interesting from a mm -hmm. personal perspective and for the entire ecosystem, right? Um, you know, in Silicon Valley. So from that perspective, I think you know, yes, would I be long Silicon Valley real estate at this particular point in time? The answer is no, right? I think that there are going to be some implications, but is this going to slow down? what comes out of Stanford, what comes out of Berkeley, what comes out of NIT, what comes out of Keio University in terms of innovative potential? I think the answer is absolutely no. No, actually, that's not quite what I was asking. I, I was really pointing to the change in psychology towards investment in high-tech ventures. But, um, yeah. Shirai, and you're shaking yeah. your head. Yeah, so this uh, investors, uh, you know, risk appetite uh, dropped significantly. No question about that. Uh, especially in the United States and uh, also Europe, uh, partly because of the all uh, raising interest rate. But uh, I think that uh, venture capital, you know, this uh, you know, negative uh, impact on uh, psychology in Japan is limited. Because limited. limited. Because uh, limited problem uh, with uh, uh, limited impact from this uh, 
uh, uh, European and American banking program. Just, just for 30 seconds, <laughs> Kathy Wood just raised $20 million <laughs> overnight in a cryptocurrency fund. I'm not sure that the risk appetite, I mean, I, I think we underestimate greed and the opportunities that I can show you. I've got at least I've got at least five emails from private equity firms who are seeing this as a huge opportunity to gobble stuff up at a discount, right? And you've got to remember, not in Japan, right? But in the United States of America, the system adjusts at incredible speed, right? What used to be 30. Uh, what used to be 100 cents on the dollar now is 70 cents on the dollar, right? Within three hours of that initial tweet that, you know, sparked some of the Silicon Valley bank runs, one of the, not made, not bulge bracket, but of the top second tier American investment banks came out and said, we will buy your deposits for, centi for 70 cents on the dollar within literally five hours. Mm. Incredible. Okay. And as it turns out, they would have made 30% profit. Okay, I stand corrected. Uh, uh, quickly, uh, like some, no, you. Okay, well, um, I'm afraid. Oops, if I can detach this microphone, which I can't. Um, I, um, well, we've reached the end of our time, unfortunately. I think we've only scratched the surface, really, of what's a, a really a very fascinating debate, and I hope we'll have a, another opportunity to resume the debate at some point. But I do want to thank our speakers very sincerely uh, for taking the time to come and speak to us. I'm reaching, and oh yes, I can find. It's our tradition here, as you know, to give a one-year honorary membership to our speakers. So, ladies first, uh, shirai your one-year honorary membership. Thank you very much. Sasaki-san, you have one of your and Jesper, I think yours is still valid, but there's a renewal. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed, and again, many thanks to our speakers. Thank you. Mm -hmm.